citizen. Oh, oh, oh. Out of many we are. We are world citizen. Same vision is for equal rights and justice. For the people, them, what's happening to this beautiful world that we're living in? World citizen, lift up your voice. Welcome. Welcome to a special episode of the People Powered Planet Podcast. Uh, each week we have amazing solutionaries join us, uh, and we're we're inspired by the by the life of Gary Davis, world citizen number one. Uh, in, in, an incredible story in the world is my country, and this morning we are having. Uh, Kind of the embodiment of the world is my country uh, in an incredible book that really uh, kind of brings the uh, stark reality of the divided borders and this, the key necessity of the vision that Gary has developed in the world is my country. Uh, we have Todd Miller, who is the author of Build Bridges, Not Walls. It's a journey, it's really a journey into kind of the united future that Gary was talking about. It's really a journey into the kind of thing that we're working with here on the People Powered Planet podcast. And Todd's work is so filled with just, um, his journey into a, into a world without borders is really an incredible investigative journalist piece where he has interviewed uh, some of the, he's gone to some of the toughest places on the planet interviewed people on all sides of it and brought it to life in just a, a, a book that is so moving and touching and personal that it really, um, it really moved me deep to my core about humanity's basic uh, role on this planet and whether we'll continue to exist and the need to just absorb what he's talked about in this book. So since it ha is filled with personal vignettes and stories, I thought we would start by having him tell us a little bit about his four-year-old son <laughs> and his adventure with borders. Uh, Todd, can you go ahead and launch us with that? Sure. At first, it's just great to be here. I'm, it's, I'm, I'm very happy to be here in conversation with you. And yeah, sure. Um, uh, my, I consulted quite often my four-year-old uh, son, William, as I was writing this book. And um, one of the one of the times um, that I consulted him, we were actually at the border wall itself. And we were in, I'm, I'm actually based in Tucson, Arizona, but we were, we were on a trip to San Diego and we went to what's known as the border field park. And that's located just south of San Diego, but right along the border wall. And so you could look, it's, it's a part of the border wall that extends into the ocean. So you can see the ocean moving through the wall and we saw, we were seeing people on the other side of it and the wall is made of steel bollards. So, and you could see people on the other side in Tijuana, they were waving to us. And so William, my four-year-old, he saw the people waving and immediately started to run towards the wall as would be a nat natural inclination, right? To go talk to the people who are waving. And as he was running, he must have, Across some sort of invisible line. Above us, there was a Border Patrol agent who was on a hill. And he, the Border Patrol agent hit his horn and went, Err. and then, then he talked through his intercom and said, do not go any further. So we just heard this kind of disembodied voice. And then William, of course, being the four-year-old that he is, looked up, looked back to the wall, looked up again, and then just kept running. And so, so the Border Patrol hit the horn again. And this time the, his, uh, his voice was even more urgent. Do not move another foot towards the wall. And so that's when William finally stopped. And when he stopped, he didn't come back. He, did, he just sat on the sand. And so I went over and sat next to him on the sand. And we talked about what had happened. We talked about the Border Patrol agent. We talked about the border wall. We talked about Mexico and the United States. And then finally, during that conversation, William looked to me, he looked over to the wall, again, it's made of steel. And he said, why can't we turn the wall into bikes? So <laughs> why can't, what, in other words, why, why are we using the steel to build a border wall when it could be built, it could be used for something much more useful and important? Wow, that reminds me of what I said when I was four years old, when I said to my dad, daddy, 
why don't they take all the guns and melt them down and turn them into doorknobs? <laughs> and so ever since my mission has been to open the doors to peace. And uh, so that really touched my heart hearing about your son. Your book touched my heart in so many ways because you interviewed people on all sides of this, uh, even border, border agents. Uh, well, we can just picture that border agent with a stern voice say, saving us from this four-year-old kid. And I think all around the world we see them saving us from kids by ripping them away from their parents and keeping these dangerous terrorists uh, from crossing these, these lines that we've, invisible lines we've drawn on a map. Um, tell me more about the mentality of the people that you interviewed who were, were the border control agents, the people who are part of this uh, border industrial complex you've talked about. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the people on the ground there as you talk to them. Yeah, sir. Sure. Well, to the the border patrol, um, I should mention that the border patrol has grown really uh, exponentially since the mid nineteen nineties to now. Mm -hmm. So, in the mid nineteen nineties, there was four thousand border patrol agents, and now there's nearly twenty one thousand. And there were some pretty pretty big hiring surges, and um, along with that, border patrol agents. Uh, if you look through, and I, uh, I like to look at the last 25 years because, uh, because um, the, the, the kind of system or strategy that's been put in place on the U.S.-Mexico border is known as prevention through deterrence. And that's been developed over this 25 years. And you can see it, the budgets have gone up from 1.5 billion to nearly 25 billion annual budgets, 1.5 billion in 1994, 25 billion um, in 2020 this year. And that is reflected in the agents, that's reflected in the border wall that we saw, in, that I just was describing in San Diego, or 700 miles of border walls and barriers. And it also refers to technology. And a lot of those technologies were, are built by private companies that are contracted by Customs and Border Protection, CBP, or Department of Homeland Security. And so I, of course, part of my investigations, I've, I've uh, interviewed many Border Patrol agents um, who are tasked with uh, guarding the, the the border zone, really. And um, I've gone to many places where, like conventions, where industry is trying to sell their technologies as well. And so I, I look, you know, I, I do talk to, um, uh, un, you know, different people with all kinds of different perspectives. The Border Patrol themselves have all kinds of unevenness you know you could interview one agent who is who is in who says well we have to um stop everyone from crossing or an another agent might say something completely different i've interviewed agents who are, are not in agreement with what they're doing but they get such a nice paycheck and they have a family and they want and they're about to retire or a number of di other different things that they feel like they have to continue doing the job. One agent that I interviewed in Bill Bridges Not Walls was an agent who had a an experience. Um, he's actually no longer an agent. He's a former, I should say former agent, but he was an agent for about seven or eight years. And I interviewed him about an experience where he was helping bring uh, a young man who was uh, dying, who, uh, from a ravine in the desert. And he was, by doing that, he was, he was holding hands with the brother of the young man. And when, during that experience, um, holding hands with the brother, and there's a much longer story that really goes into this. But while holding the hands, actually, I should say, they tried to like make a human stretcher to bring the young man who was in distress um, out of the ravine. He was in, the young man was in distress. You could see bile coming from, Side of his mouth, who was starting to vomit. It was it was a, a scenario like we have seen on the U.S. Mexico border now for years and years and years. There's been eight thousand people at least who have died crossing the U.S. Mexico border, and so um, the border patrol agent he 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 uh, radioed for the helicopter to come. The helicopter said they couldn't get down to the ravine, and so they they had to then carry the young man out of the ravine. And um, which was a hard task. He was a stocky. He was kind of stocky and heavy, but they but they um, they clasped arms at the elbows. 
to make it like a human stretcher to bring the boy up. And while that was happening, it was such a hot day, the sun was burning down and the sweat made their hands slip. And then when their hands slipped, they ended up um, hold, holding and, and ended up holding their hands. And uh, this, this created a moment that the agent said, and his name was Brendan Lenahan. Lenahan said, it was a strangely intimate moment. A person who I, I would be normally arresting, I was now holding his hand. And then a, a moment later, he lost a sense of who he was. He lost a sense of who he was as a border patrol agent. He looked down at the boy in, in their hands or like, like laying in their kind of human stretcher while he was holding the hands of his brother and he thought the boy was his own brother. And this went on for a very, very long moment until his, his uh, radio crackled and then he came back to his senses. And um, so I get, so this, this is a story I depict in the book from a border patrol agent who had one of the most amazing experiences of empathy that I think I've ever, ever heard anyone relay. And, um, and, uh, and so, which, which, which also gives us like very interesting perspective into the border, what the border is, what is going on with, with the agents, wh who the agents are, how the agents have to like, they're very different, they're human beings, right? The agents are human beings. And yet the brutality and, the, and even the violence of this border system um, is, is a part of their daily lives and they break through it, like in the, in the sense of that moment with Brendan Lenahan at least, in, 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 f in maybe fleeting moments or maybe more long lasting moments. In his case, he actually left the border patrol um, with these moments of intense empathy with the people that, that, that he is dealing with. Well, it's interesting that uh, uh, one of the things that you point out in these borders around the world and your adventures not only are in Mexico, but you know, in, 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 in rough border crossings everywhere. And it's amazing that in most cases, it's the people who who raise our children, build our houses, uh, uh, nurture our, our babies, uh, that we're protecting ourselves from with these walls and that we're dividing up the people who we should be having the most empathy for, it would seem like, I mean, we do when we connect personally. And, and yet, uh, uh, tell me a little more about that irony that you, that you point out in your book. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's true. I <laughs> mean, you look, you look um, this, uh, you know, who's doing a lot of the hard labor. I remember one, one moment in the book, we were in a shelter and um, in Nogales, which is right across the border from uh, where, well, it's, it's very close to where I live in Tucson, but we went to Mexico, we were in a shelter. We're talking with people who had just been deported. And um, one of the people in the shelter, and by we, I was with a student group and we were kind of having a dialogue, the student group with, with the people who were recently deported. And um, while we were having this discussion, a man in the, in the group looked at us and said, why are you doing this? Why, why, why are you doing this to us? And I know that he meant not the actual students, he meant, you know, the, in his case, he probably meant the US government. Why, but, but he said, then he said, we do all your work. We do all your labor. Um, and, all we want is, you know, to, to get enough money so we can, and he, and he used the word, give a taco to our children, right? So in other words, feed, feed our children. And he really kept, you know, it was like one of those things that he just kind of broke through, you know, any of the niceties and just went right to the, for the jugular, jugular really. And, um, and um, it's true. I mean, when you look at uh how lay, the, the way the labor is laid out, like who's picking the vegetables, who's cleaning the toilets, you know, who's doing all the hard work. And a lot of that is done by undocumented people who come across the border. You see that in, in Gaza and Israel, which we'll have to be talking about next week. Next week. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, so it's, it's very similar and very similar in many places around the world. And wherever there's a kind of, um, asymmetrical border uh, and anywhere you have people coming from one side of it who end up often doing the the hard labor on the other side of of that border so that's it's a it's a phenomenon that you see everywhere now one of the interesting things you point out in your book is that this isn't just uh, uh, 
you know, okay, here we have this asymmetrical things. These people are coming, trying to get our jobs and our resources. Uh, the reason why uh, they're so, you, you have a very telling point where you point out that the reason they're so impoverished is that, you know, Africa is actually the richest continent in the world, for example. All our cell phones, all the minerals all come from there. Uh, we, you know, Latin America is filled with all these other resources. And that it's not just accidental, it, it's that U.S., that, that, that the moneyed interests, uh, well, tell us about the moneyed interests that have been extracting these resources and how they've caused this dysfunction that uh, we're talking about. Sure. I mean, you can look almost anywhere and you see, like right now in Latin America, if you look at Mexico, if you look at Guatemala, if you look at Honduras, if you look at um, <clears throat> many different places, there's all kinds of extractive industry. And, and I think this is a good meta. I mean, it's real, but it's also a good metaphor to what you're talking about, because the extractive industry goes into places, you know, mining, sometimes dams, sometimes, you know, water companies. Um, they'll go into places and take, you know, the stuff, you know, the resources that, the life-giving resources of the areas, um, particularly water. And uh, like, even if a mining company goes into a place, they use a lot of water in the extractive industry. So you have, you have say a mining company going into a community in Mexico, say Zacatecas, because I know an incident, um, of this happening in Zacatecas, and the mining company then um, then it then begins to extract copper or silver, and to extract the the metals from from the you know the, the precious metal from the stone you have to use they use chemicals like cyanide cyanide gets into the water supplies and all of a sudden you have a contaminated water as as was this case in Zacatecas that I'm talking about, and and then then all of a sudden you have a whole community who, who um, n there's a mine there and there's no more water and what water is left is, is, is unsafe to drink, unsafe to use. And so these sorts of things, these sorts of things are, are happening. In other words. Um, and then the people in the area haven't gained wealth from that extraction. Uh, no. Just in the greater poverty. Yeah. I mean, the, they they come they come with idea like the 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 um they'll say oh there's going to be jobs for the people but the jobs are really ill paid they don't last long they're very temporary and they're very 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 dangerous and so what's left what happens is the wealth is extracted and exactly as you say the land is degraded and more impoverished and that and you can look and see that people are leaving areas like that. And that's just but one example of um, of how this is playing out. You can also look at climate change, right? And the, the different things happening with with the changing climates. Uh, and if you you look at the United States, which has historically emitted um, way more greenhouse gas emissions than like Guatemala, for example, and yet like the small farmers in Guatemala right now, they're just they're having serious troubles with droughts and and hurricanes actually so you have the either too much or too little the rains that used to come with consistency are not coming with consistency anymore and now there's you're, you're seeing more displacement and more people on the move and heading over borders and coming to the united states due to these factors so you so you can look at it from a number of different perspectives well it's interesting that uh, you also point out that uh that uh Decades ago, the U.S. government and realized that we were facing this uh, incredible damage to the uh, planet and the environment and the, and the military calculated the consequences that would cause. And instead of putting that money, which would have been enough to actually have solved the problem, uh, into solving the problem, we put it all into security so we could fight the displaced people and, and, and fight for the few remaining resources while the earth goes down the tubes. It's kind of the picture you, you painted. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's a sudden, if you look at these budgets, I mean, you just look, I, I just did the calculation of the border and immigration enforcement budget from 9-11, or since the de implementation of the Department of Homeland Security, and that was in 2003. And you go to 2003 to now, and you add up all the budgets for Customs and Border Protection and ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement, 
And it comes to, and I can't remember the exact number, but like $350 billion. And then you start looking at that $350 billion. And it, and then you go back, when I, when I think of this, I think back to the wall, my, my four-year-old, now five-year-old, at the wall um, saying, why can't we turn this wall into bikes? When I look at that $350 billion going for since 2003 into this massive border and immigration enforcement apparatus that creates the walls, that creates the technologies, that has the, the drones, that has more than 200 um, detention centers, that, that incarcerates people, that really actually causes immense suffering for people, for people. And you think about all that money spent, spent on that, and then, then you think, well, how could this money be better spent? And, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, you start thinking about all kinds of other things, like how, what are, what are ways that that sort of money could be spent for human well-being? Um, like the water example I just gave, like you could look at the cyanide in Zacatecas, you could look at Flint, Michigan, right? The, that, that kids are drinking leaded water. Wouldn't clean water as just one example of many be, be a, a, a better place to invest money for human security and human well-being rather than a drone flying over the U.S.-Mexico borderlands? Yeah, I mean, here you have this uh, incredible threat, and so instead of dealing with it by dissipating the threat, you, uh, which you could, you easily have enough money to eliminate the problem and not have that threat. Instead, you put it into building, building, bridge, building, uh, trying to wall it out and just do temporary measures that fail and don't give us what we want. Well, tell us more about this border industrial complex. You've mentioned some of the key companies and the fact that this uh, has maintained similar uh, policies, whether it's Democrat or Republican administrations, uh, that the, the the financial strings that have been set in motion uh, kind of are commanding this. Tell us about that. Yeah, again, this, this the border industrial par um, complex really comes off these budgets that have been just grown dramatically over the last 25 years. Like you, the 1.5 billion when these operations like in the Clinton administration, Democrat, right? Bill Clinton administration in 1994 had a number of operations, Operation Gatekeeper, Safeguard, Hold the Line, that really put a lot of um, resources on the border, hired more border patrol agents. All of this was then carried on by the George W. Bush administration, particularly in the post 9-11 era. And so by the end of the George W. Bush administration, you went from 1.5 billion in 1994 with Clinton to 15 billion by in 2008, that was going to border and immigration enforcement, and this, these are annual budgets. And how much are they then, in order to maintain that, uh, actually becoming the, the lobbyists and so on that write the laws that are that self feed this system? Yeah, that's exactly what's happening, and you see that particularly um, in the post 9/11 era when these budgets are going up. There's more and more contracts given to private industry and private industry ranging from, you know, companies that I'm sure everyone's heard of like Lockheed Martin or Northrop Grumman or, or General Dynamics to a lot of to other smaller companies. Um, the, the big military companies are, of course, their big contracts are with the US military and other militaries around the world, but they are increasingly moving to what they call the border security market. And so they put applications like, um, the drones are, are predator bees that were used in Afghanistan and Iraq and now are used on the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, manufactured by the company General Atomics. And then they get the contracts, and of course they want more contracts, and they want contracts to maintain, like you just mentioned, their, their products. And so when appropriations comes around every year, appropriations is, is the time when the budgets are determined for places like Department of Homeland Security, me and you are not in the conversation, most likely, but the lot, but they are very much getting behind closed doors and key con with key congressional members, with members of the appropriation committee in the Senate and the Congress, and really influencing the budgets. And then, of course, the budgets come with earmarks, and the earmarks are like, oh, let's give another five hundred 
million dollar contract to General Atomics to maintain the drone system that they have or to increase it by another plane or or Lockheed Martin, let's have another couple of planes from them or, um, let, or let's expand our biometric systems which is a big, this is a huge submarket for 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 the border at this moment the kind of digitizing of the border and and so you have this whole system the lobbyists going in and 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 influencing campaign contributions are also a part of it with with campaigns and and what what has formed is an industrial complex that seems to be growing for the sake of growth so when i was uh... Uh, in elementary school, about the time when Dwight D. Eisenhower gave his famous speech warning about the uh, incredible danger of this military industrial complex uh, to our liberties, to our future, to the, to the very well-being, the, the, the ability of us to maintain uh, life on earth uh, and to make it a, a life that's worth living for everyone. Uh, when he gave that speech, I would walk to school from, uh, I would take a shortcut through the, the Sheraton Park Hotel and they would have these weapons exhibits going on, which I was sort of fascinated with as a kid to take a look at. And you'd go in there, and the thing I most like is getting little, little like free pens shaped like MX missiles and uh, uh, free these little giveaway toys. But here, are these uh, these these comp comp same companies you've mentioned, uh, Grumman, Martin Marietta, and so on, they're like selling MX missiles, and they're advertising with with toys and gimmicks to get people to come to their booth. Uh, to promote these products, and it's it's uh, tell us more about those weapons bazaars. I actually did a documentary on that called the Weapons Bazaar, but tell us more about your experience with those. Yeah, sure. Um, they're like Homeland Security bazaars. Uh, the um, I've been to so many of them over year over the years, and and actually, Bill Bridges is my is my fourth book, and on on the board on borders and looking at borders um, and from many different angles. So throughout all those different books that I've written, um, I have, I've gone to dozens of these, of these um, conventions and they're just um, incredible. <laughs> I, 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 even though I've set, set foot into many of them, even now, you know, and I know what to expect. If I set foot into, to one of these Conventions are usually in a convention center. I've been to them in the United States, but also around the world. I've been to one in Tel Aviv, for example, on um, Paris, Mexico City. Uh, and what normally happens is, is there's a part of it in a convention center where you'll hear people talk, usually Homeland Security officials or government officials and industry representatives. And there's another part, which is like a, is, is a, is like a convention center hall. And you go in there and it's just, you're like, it's like you're walking into a science fiction novel. Um, it, they're usually, you know, with the high ceilings and the banners from different companies, you know, hanging from, from the ceilings, Raytheon or Elbit Systems. And all around, there's this kind of a dazzling display. So if I were like you as a youngster, you know, walking by there, I would be, except they won't let you in these days. You just can't walk in. You have to, you have, you have to go through the, the ringer to get in there. But, but, um, but it, it has that allure, right? You look and you just see like drones, uh, robots crawling along carpets, um, the, the high tech cameras, the aerostats, which are like surveillance balloons. And it's, it's almost like being in a crystal ball of the future. That's that's um because because they're, they're, they're vendors are trying to sell it to governments. The the um the government may or may not buy it or not. But this is what is being imagined between the two for the future of a border scape, right? The the way that a border will look or is is kind of evolving to look. So you get this kind of glimpse into the crystal ball, and um and it's exactly what's 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 happening like right for example the drones that that are flying over the border 20 years ago that you would think that is just somebody's fantasy right there's just no way that these unmanned aerial systems are going to be flying over without a pilot and now they're just commonplace and so the kind of science fiction mind um now the maybe the robot like i talked to one vendor who had these like spherical robots and they were going to be used on on Mars, and for NASA was going to use them on Mars. But now, and or in the moment that I saw the vendor, he said, 
well, let's let's now bring them to the border and they could be like robotic border patrol agents. And I went, are you kidding me? Are you think you're really thinking that you're gonna put these spheres on the border? And he said, yeah, like in packs of 20 or 25, they'll roam the border like agents. And now granted that didn't ha or that hasn't happened yet. I should say hasn't happened yet. But the fact that he's saying that and selling that and it's in the, you're in the imagination of it, of the, the industrial complex, right? That could happen, right? The idea that there will be robotic border patrol agents could be something in our future. And that's, that's one, those are some of the main th things I always get from these conventions. Is this the future? Is this the future that we, the people of the planet, want to envision and create for our, for our small planet here going through space? I don't, I don't think, I really don't, you know, so like in Bill Bridges, you talk, I, I talk to so many people, nobody, like all the people I talk, including the border, you know, the border patrol agent that I just mentioned, nobody is talking about that as, as anything that anyone wants. You know, my, my four-year-old, right, saying, let's build bikes instead of walls, that captures the spirit of what people are saying. When you talk to people and you ask them about, about the border, and you bring it to them and you say, is this, do you think this is what we should be doing? Or is there another, uh, is there another thing that we can do? There's always like almost always the answer is there's something else that we can do. Um, and so that's another, that's another um, very interesting thing about these conventions because you're in the, in, in the imagination of the industrial complex, but this imagination is so divorced so divorced from, from regular people or what regular people are thinking or what regular people even know what's going on on the border. And so, so my answer would be no to your question. No, nobody, people would not be interested in generally speaking. There's probably exceptions though. So what, it, what is the future that you envision that if, if we do what Gary talked about, if we can, if we the people can, well, can do what actually Every constitution says what the Declaration says of, of, of human rights, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that the will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of government. And the uh, Declaration of Independence says it's right, the right of the people to institute new government. Uh, now, what Gary Davis called for in his book, in, in the movie, and I think you may have seen that, he called for uh, he said, the nation states aren't going to do it. That old system's too broken. He said, we, the people, just have to get together and meet in the same room like we're doing here with these little Zoom conferences, conferences all over and amalgamate that into the will of the people of the planet. Uh, what do you envision as, uh, as, as the kind of future you would like us to picture and envision for our planet? I think, uh, you know, when thinking of uh, Gary Davis and his work and uh, the film um, that I saw, your film, um, I mean, I think there's, there's, uh, I mean, there's, a, I think there's so much to that vision of, of a world. I think the idea that, um, um, that nation, you know, the idea of a world divided into nation states is um, in which Gary Davis challenges time and the challenge with his entire life, really, um, um, uh, up up until his very death, <laughs> as, as you depicted so well, you know that um, to, to, that sort of declaration of a world of of a world citizen, the idea, the kind of epiphany of of a war, you know that you know that war, like like one of the things that different nation states causes is wars between nation states right and um and i find so so those sorts of enlight, enlightening envision enlightening visions of of the future i think are um are really uh helpful i think one of the problems is is what i found you know in, in what i find with the borders and what i find with there's a certain reluctance to, to questioning the border, right? The border is, is treated almost as, and when I say border, I mean the nation state, right? The nation state is what represents the border. There's a reluctance, there's a sort of, you bring up the idea of not even getting, like I, I wanna go like Davis, you know, like the nation states is, is actually the problem, right? Um, 
but you can't it's even if you mentioned open borders right so you have the freedom of movement of people across the borders that 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 whole concept has been stigmatized in in a, in a way that it's you might be ridiculed by it um or at least that's a lot of my experience when talking to certain sectors of people and and so so i think like these these ideas like like gary davis's life um that that envision the world outside of those kind of boundaries, inside of those boxes, outside of a world that's confined to these boundaries of nation states and envision, and we begin to envision something new. Now, I don't know the answer, you know, I don't, I don't know what that answer is, but I think like to go like the idea of a people powered planet or the idea of inspired by, you know, people like Gary Davis, it's, it's, it's a world where people are, in conversation and creating something new and not and not um divided it's a world of people i mean really like the, the title of my book building bridges instead of walls bridges are interconnections and interconnections right they're literal bridges but there's also metaphorical bridges and those interconnections are people coming together and when people come together the kind of creativity a person will have or 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 a just world right um that's that doesn't seem to be happening in this kind of confluence of of nation states we live in there's not a just world that sort of just world comes from from a more grassroots level from people coming together and imagining something new and i think like by releasing the sort of border systems that we have you allow that to happen and you allow new processes to happen and and to me what would be really exhilarating would be to part to be a part of those sorts of processes, you know, to be a part of that process of 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 imagining something new. Mm. Well, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, us being in conversation. I love that, and and in a way, what Gary envisioned in his synergistic model of government is very much what we see happening. Where you know, here we are having a conversation with people can be in in, in Israel or Pakistan or wherever, and. Uh, he saw you know, lots of these small group conferences crossing, crossing political boundaries with, with having uh, uh, technologies like revolutionary conversations and other. Well, there's so many technologies that help us get to the essential question of what we want as human beings. What's our hopes and aspirations? Same kind of thing you did in your book with border guards and others. And you find that people on opposite sides of these issues are all like, when, when, once you get into that kind of intimate conversation, they all come together. Uh, and we see that in, uh, uh, there was a film like Free Trip to Egypt. This fellow went to Trump rallies with a sign, Free Trip to Egypt. He got some people to sign up. They went to go live with a, with a, with a Muslim family. And they were like, wow, I wish all Muslims were like you. I wish all Israelis, were, I wish all Jewish people were like you. I mean, once you make that human connection, and once we find a way to make that connection part of the system by which we govern our planet, where we, instead of being a race to the bottom, the lowest, common denominator, rather come to what is the highest and best wisdom of each person in the planet coming together to heal our world, uh, we could have a powerful force. And uh, and that's, by the way, why I have this poster of, of uh, Wizard of Oz behind me, because, you know, Gary and I both love that play, because here Dorothy was, you know, we had to go convince, find the mighty wizard, get the mighty wizard to save us. And, uh, you know, we have to go lobby Congress and get Congress to do this or save it. We've got to do this and that. And then uh, all along, she found out all she had to do is click her heels that, that, that she could go home. The power was within her. And I think what, what Gary Davis is t was talking about in the People Powered Planet was that each of us has that power inside. Once we, you know, make that click in our minds that we're not the governed, we're the governors of our world, and that we're the sovereigns that every constitution says that we're the ones that <laughs> create them and put them in power we can invent with the incredible genius of humanity a new system and if we can envision it and picture it and inspire people to it uh, everyone wants that like you said they, they, they don't they don't want it it's like here we have this planet in, in incredible danger that's in danger because it's locked itself in these boxes and barbed wire borders and the people want to come together they want to live they want to live like the ast astronauts saw our planet uh, how do we how do we unleash that uh, incredible uh 
love and connection people have. I, mean, I think we're doing it a little bit with all these YouTube videos. Even animals are coming together across species that we're supposed to uh, hate and eat each other. I think there is a rise of the human spirit happening. Uh, how can we uh, help further that from, from, from your interconnection and your experience as you were writing this book? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you're, what all you just said is exactly right. I mean, that what's, what we have is a world of, it's been created, so people are divided, right? And, and the divisions are everywhere. And, uh, and um, almost what it might take is just to remove the divisions <laughs> and allow, like, 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 I think I even, it was an epiphany in the book, even, I think I, somewhere in the book, I was in an epiphany, it's like you move, remove the divisions and then the bridge forms. That, so the connections naturally, by removing these barbed wire divisions that are just so promulgate everything, every, every time one's moved, that offers opportunity to, for interconnection across what was before divided. And in those interconnections, in, in a world where I, I think, I think you were just talking about where potential is instead of you're, you're, you're being driven to the ground, you're being uplifted by the world, right? And, and, and to, to see things in that way and people coming together in that way, uh, I think there's just potential for something amazing to be created. Um, but, um, and, uh, but I think, I mean, I think one of, one of the things that we need to do is remove these divisions uh, and, and maybe you just remove them by just going to that world of interconnectivity and saying okay i'm just going to start doing that anyhow and i'm just going to work in this way anyhow and and maybe these things these kind of divisions and and enforced divisions will start to start to start to break up and disintegrate on their own wow that's so beautiful, and uh, it'd be, and it's a wonderful place to turn to questions. Uh, so let's turn to some questions, and then maybe also you might touch on, uh, maybe during the question period, on what happened in Europe when they did take down these these borders that had divided them. They fought, you know, two wars, millions, hundreds, you know, sixty million people killed in in, in a war and more, uh, and they took those borders down between it and, and did what you had, what you say happened. Uh, maybe you could touch on that, and then we'll throw it open to everyone else's questions. Yeah, sure. Um, the Schengen area is very, I think that is a really good example of how, one, you just can, you don't have to have the border, the border controls. You could just, they're there one day, and you say, okay, we don't want them there anymore. And it's just that simple. It's like when you said, uh, well, you just have to switch a click to this click a switch in your in your head well you can do that with this too it was funny i i was um just down at the new kind of trump wall at the border in arizona and there was a wall before so this is this 30 foot wall was re replacing a 15 foot wall but one of the things i noticed besides the 30 foot wall was the fact that the 15 foot wall was like on the it was just there it was but it was taken down it was thrown in a pile i'm like really so it's that easy that you just can just say, okay, we don't want this anymore. And you take it down and you just throw it in a pile. And there it is in the pile. Maybe, maybe you make bikes out of it. I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's throw it open to questions. Wow, goodness. Todd, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is such an eye-opening a thing for a lot of people because I think we just get stuck. That's there. It's been there or... Uh, it just seems like, oh, we're safer with a wall, like a wall of our house, you know, that kind of people related to that way. But it's basically divide and conquer. So we're being conquered, uh, you know, manipulated to keep in the military industrial complex. And um, our eyes need to be opened. I, this is just fantastic. You're doing this work. Great mm -hmm. book. Everyone should get it. Um, we do have some questions. So we have Mike Caruso. You are up. Mike. Okay, well, thank you. That was a great, uh, great presentation. And uh, the question I have uh, is a little, maybe a little bit off base, maybe not. It's, it's regarding, um, you know, patriotism and um, being in Rotary, and uh, especially speaking with Rotarians from the U.S., if you really mm -hmm. 
want to see some very, very strange stares at you. Just tell them that you think patriotism is perhaps not the best thing in the world because <laughs> you were programmed towards that from probably pre-kindergarten that our country is the best. And I'm, I'm sure this probably applies to many or most countries. But I've been thinking about the Olympics. And you always hear this is great because it brings nations together. But then when you watch Olympic events, the patriotism comes right, right out in front. I mean, you see all these flags of you know, whatever people are, are competing or teams are competing. And then at the end, you always, you know, there's always supposed to the tally of what country is ahead of what other country. Then this, this idea of superlatives of winning at whatever cost. Do, do you think the Olympics is a, is a good or bad thing? I, maybe a double-edged sword. Uh, um, what interesting question. I've never had this question before. That's very interesting. Um, I mean, my inclination is that the, I like the Olympics. I like to watch the Olympics. Um, I like, I like watching, com you know, sporting competitions like that. Um, I do think it could be set up. It's, it is set up in a way you, you bring people people and <clears throat> all over the all over the world um i always think back like i remember i was in guatemala um i think it was the 2000 olympics and um there was a cartoon that said they had the, the rings there was zero 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 but it was like the cartoon was like the, the number of gold silver or bronze medals that guatemala has ever won in the summer i, I can't remember if it was the summer or, or winter olympics i think it was the summer in the Summer Olympics, so I, I always remember, I always remember that that one, and I remember thinking, well, if um if there were if there were events like crossing the the Rio Suciate, which <laughs> my moms were doing, get into Mexico and evading border guards, or you know going over walls, or you know I'm sure they would be taking in many gold medals, um, <laughs> but I was. You know, I, I, I think about like stuff like that too. You know, what if, what if um, the Olympics themselves, it seems like, I remember, you know, the first Olympics that I, that I saw myself, you know, watching the United States and, and um, Russia or even the USSR at the time um, in an almost cold war of, uh, you know, in this, con and, and, and to me, I don't know how helpful that is. I, I would love to see more of an even playing field I really like bringing the world together in, in these sorts of competitions. I'm wondering, like in our kind of critique we've had of nation states, perhaps there's a better way, like region regions, or I don't know. I mean, of course, I don't. I I think, you know, like certain. I don't know how you do it, but maybe if you could take that sort of um, overt patriotism in that sort of way and and have, have, but also have the competition at the same time um, or something like that instead of it becoming, you know, this patriotic thing, uh, more like, oh, I'm rooting, maybe rooting for the whatever team from whatever region I'm in, but I'm not gonna be like, oh, we're the best, you know? And, uh, and yeah, I don't know how you do that really. I mean, as you said, I think you alluded to, a lot of this stuff is ingrained from very early ages and, Maybe it'll take some work to to um, to uh, loosen the loosen those reins, but uh, but I don't know. Those are some some thoughts. I loose thoughts at that that I that I had uh, with your question. Thank you. Great and great question, Mike. Yes, um, I was thinking maybe the regional idea was good. Maybe have a surprise thing at the end where certain uh, team members have to be together and that's your team now we just you know okay it's a raffle and you're in this team and then those are the world teams and you name them different something but right instantly like it's like you don't know who you're going to be with and then the camaraderie because there's a camaraderie that happens during the olympics that's incredible they get together they eat together and you know may the best person win whatever whatever but then you have two different 
things that people are like, well, what, what about the world team? Which world team, <laughs> Zambadia, whatever, whatever they call it. Um, how did that one do? Because, you know, you have, okay, U.S., but look at the, how did the world team do? Anyway, that's just my idea. Good that's question. Nice. Wow. Um, yeah, we have a question from Fried. If you could go ahead, Fried. Hello, everyone. Um, my question is, in fact, a suggestion uh, <clears throat> for something walls into bridges and that would be uh, a uh, design for an environmentally friendlier airport and the one who thought about this that was Jim Starry and unfortunately he died uh, one and a half years ago but his uh, starport is still uh, actual I think because it's an en environmental friendlier airport and he once said that his his airport was intended also for Gaza to Israel so that the airport is uh, built um, for landing uphill and then you have the terminal uh, and you start downhill. So it's a very compact airport, which, which saves a lot of energy and which gives a huge uh, amount of uh, um, uh, real estate space. I like the idea because I just saw uh, the Coronado Island that has the Navy base and it's three-fourths this airport. And just this idea of going up, you know, to go up and down, you know, that is a great idea. D Todd, did you have a comment about that? No, but I, I thank you for sharing that. I think, I, and I take the spirit of, of turning these walls into something different that's more beneficial. Mm -hmm. and, and I think a more environmentally air friendly airport would be a, a, one of those things. So thank okay. you for sharing that idea. Uh, airports are critical to connect everybody too. So uh, thank you for you. I appreciate that. I could, I could add that there, uh, Jim Starry invented the parallel runways and he was never credited for that. But uh, uh, Chicago Airport has now four parallel runways because it's the only way that huge amount of air planes can be handled in a safe way. Wow. So all over the world, there are only parallel runways now. Wow. Thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you for introducing that, Fried. Thank you. Um, now we would like to go to Peter. Peter, if you could ask your question. Sure. Um, for a, a, a dialogue, Todd, I live close to the border. Uh, um, and this last year and, and longer, I've been doing long bike rides, some of them right down to Border State Field Park. So it's interesting right. To be right there with the one Border Patrol guy that you sort of get to know almost personally. And you're, you're right, they're people like you and me doing their job. Uh, but this bollard wall has, has grown tremendously from, uh, I think the original were the, the metal grates from Vietnam were maybe 10, 14 feet high. Uh, all numbered. Now there's a double wall that snakes its way, you know, from the sea all the way east. Um, that's where I wanted to go with this. I used to uh, still do bike along that east of Otay Mesa's border crossing. That's where they built the six or eight concrete demonstration early for the former guy. He built his demo walls and, and those went up and came down. They continued the bollard wall out there all the way out into the, the really high mountains that uh, finally ended where kind of the end of Tijuana did. And I suppose if somebody was inspired, they could walk around, but it would be, be tough, tough terrain. And uh, until about recently, there was a huge construction project, speaking of the money here, massive amounts of work, guys, trucks, bollards on their sides being built into the hills further east into Arizona then as well, as you've said. Um, I find them just offensive. You know, the, they're so, uh, um, they're so imposing in, in what we've created uh, right next door to me. And 
I, I almost wanted to go in with Hallel for a second. You said Hallel, you're from, or I, I heard you're from Israel right now, and, and I've never been there. Uh, but there are these massive walls that I've seen, I, I'm going to say, between Israel and Gaza, or Israel and the West Bank, that similarly must just be offensive to certain people, but I don't, I don't know how to get, I don't know how to get beyond it yet. I don't know how to tear, tear them down and get to the handshake, build a bridge. Um, so that's my story. Have you um, seen uh, the artist Khaled Jarrar? He's um, a Palestinian art artist who's based in Ramallah. And uh, he, I, I, I would uh, suggest he has this um, video out where he takes one of the bollards down. I think he was on the Tijuana side, but at the border, border field state park and he like takes it down. Um, I don't know how, how on he did that. It's a great, great, like a seven minute video. And he turns, he turns the bollard into, um, into a ladder. <laughs> he takes the bollard from San Diego, brings it all the way to Las Cruces, New Mexico, and then turns it into a ladder and then go puts and then he goes and puts it in Ciudad Juarez. It's an art, it's an artist, it's an artistic project. But he had another one where he was at the at the cement wall in, in Jerusalem on the on the Ramola side in the on the West Bank. And he um, took a sledgehammer to the to the wall. He would do that every day. He took like a chisel and a, sh and a sledgehammer and he'd get like cement chunks from the wall. And so what he did was that he, he collected these cement chunks and then he melted them down. And then he, he, he started making sculptures of, the, of what was the concrete wall. And he, what his sculpture, his first one was of a soccer ball because the wall actually cut through a, a soccer field. Some of the kids, the kids love the soccer field. But he wanted to give the sculpture back to the kids. So he made like a soccer ball and cleats and a bunch of things like that. But I think, I mean, that alludes to what you're talking about. And he says in the, in the video, he says, I cannot accept that this wall is in my face. That was one of my favorite, quote, one of my favorite quotes. Um, and so, I mean, it's his, the artist is Khaled Gerard, K-H-A-L-E-D-J, a R R A R, and if you put a video U.S. Mexico border, um, Jerusalem or something like that, you it'll come up Perfect. as the video. Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to send it back to Arthur. Arthur, take it away. Fences offend us. Friendship defends us. <laughs> I think that's kind of a, my summary of what you've told us uh, as you're standing there looking at these border fences, these fences that these fences offend us. It's really friendship that defends us. So I hope we will uh, all find ways to connect across the borders around the world and actually just let them dissolve like they did in Europe. Uh, we, can, we don't have to fight them. We don't have to get rid of them. They'll turn into museums. One day uh, there'll be a museum as there it, it was in Europe for a while. Some of these old border crossings you get to see. Kids can come over and, and say, oh, look, that's, that's where my bicycle got made. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> next week we're going to have uh, my daughter, Aura Canagas, who is the director of the American Friends Service Committee, the Quaker organization that since 1949 has been uh, really they played a key role. They were Nobel Prize winners for some of the key work they've done in, in the Middle East and bringing uh, uh, in, in, in both relief after World War II and in uh, bringing connections there. And she's done a lot of work in, in, in Gaza, the extreme power disparities that uh, we're, there, we're facing there and how do we bring those people, big people together into a, a peaceful resolution? And she's joined by Merle Lefkoff, uh, who is actually uh, one of our board members and is president of the Center for Emergent Diplomacy. And they're going to share some firsthand uh, experiences with uh, how, we, how we begin to make peace in the, in the Middle East. So uh, I hope you'll join us next week at the same time at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, uh, 1700. Greenwich Mean Time, I believe it is. And, uh, and I want to just especially thank our incredible guest, Todd, 
and have him tell us how we can get this amazing book and his other amazing books. Uh, do read it. I mean, it's just like a mind boggling book that the, the way he's integrated it, beautiful writing where he's integrated personal stories that leave you hanging while he's throwing in the facts and figures as you're waiting for the answer to what happened next in that personal story. It's just uh, a compelling book, well, well written. And uh, uh, he was, uh, I want to hear more in the future about uh, his work with Witness for Peace and Oaxaca. My wife and I had so much fun in Oaxaca and I know he's done more there. So we could talk for hours more, but uh, let's close it now by turning it back to Todd for a final last word and, and how uh, you can all uh, get his book and join him in this quest uh, to, uh, to move beyond the borders that divide us. Well, thank you, Arthur. Um, I'd be more than happy to talk about Oaxaca, you know, and, um, and um, I'm so happy, to, you know, to be on your program and to be able to talk about these important issues in an inspired way. I really, I really appreciate that. Rather than trying to, defend, you know, like everyone's saying that's <laughs> you're trying to defend it. And this is, I like this conversation because it, it, we talked about it in a very inspired way and a and a creative way. So I, tr I really appreciate that. Um, Bill Burt does not walls. Um, the best way to get it is uh, through the publisher, City Lights Books, and you can just order it at their website. Um, it's also available, you can get it on any regular way, but that's the way I normally suggest. And um, I and I and they published two of my books as well, if you're interested in delving into the past books. And I have another one published with Verso. You can get, you can see it all um, and you can look on Amazon or something like that as well to find the books. Yeah, I enjoyed reading the, the Kindle edition. Uh, so that's also available there. And uh, yes. and also, do you have a copy of the book right there to show us? Uh, you can uh, off the screen a second. Uh, isn't that bird a piece of the fence? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there we go. Look at that. Look at yeah. that, everybody. So see yeah. that piece of the fence has flown off into being a bird. Uh, gorgeous, gorgeous example of just what we're talking about. Now all the bird needs is a bicycle. <laughs> 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 Same concept, right? You know, the fence is the fence, or maybe it could be something else. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing everything with us. And everyone have a wonderful week. And we look forward to seeing you next week for the next episode of the People Powered Planet podcast. World citizen, lift up your voices. Oh, you know we got something to say. All we need is the same directions. Heading in one way. One way. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel and like this video.